This is live stream from Behind the Beyond with Skinny White. The stream will begin shortly. If you're watching this on the playback, just skip forward a little bit. Anyway, settle in. We'll begin soon. Nuke, have I got a story for you. I'll save it for the middle. Patrick H., hello to you. Ultraman, Nuke, Artful, Brandy Nicole, Make Mine a 99. All friends of mine. Lady Nuke, my Ian. It'll be a good show tonight. Give it another minute or so, and we'll get started with our Saturday night. All right, hey, guess what, Chet? We're talking about Freaky Mountains tonight. You were probably able to deduce that from the title of this stream. Oh boy, how momentous it has all been. Um, some ups, some downs, all kinds of things. I haven't uh, broadcasted in two weeks or, or spoken to many of you <clears throat> in a couple of weeks. We've had a lot of uh, things going on. Developments in my wife's family that are none too pleasant. So we'll just uh, throw up prayers and positive thoughts uh, about that. And at the same time as all of that is going on, we had I don't know what else you'd call it. A blow-up. Touched the algorithm. The previous live stream, which was about the Leah fail, that was the St. Pat's Day live stream, was for some reason a success. Brought something like 35 or, or 40 subscribers. Uh, Patrick H., that's fine. Thank you. It's been a while, says Patrick H., since I had a chance to catch a show, putting in the time now, hello, Skinny. Hello to you, Patrick H. Hello to all of you. Without you, this show is nothing. You already know that. Road to 1K says make mine. It seems like we're headed there, and we're also very quickly headed towards 
the Super Chats memberships and things like that. It, we may already be there that's being processed right now. So, <laughs> all right. We told a friend, says Nuke. Well, good. Because that's definitely, that's helped dramatically. Dramatically. Xterra Bill, let me catch up with all of you before we begin the show. Says, hello, Mr. Who White and Chet. Xterra Bill, hello to you, my musician friend. Um, and then anybody that I missed, Eric Kaufman. Only mids, Cosset, our sponsor. And Brandy Nicole with a lot of stakes. Make mine a 99 with a lot of stakes. Lady Nuke with a bunch of stakes. I like to see it. Thank you for that. We've got an interesting show tonight. There was a lot of research that went into it, and it got to a point where there was so much of it and so many notes that it started to, to not <laughs> make sense anymore. And that will happen when you're looking at these weird, these freaky mountains. When you're out here asking questions, questions, questions. Especially about scary mountains. Now I'll ask you up front, Chet, viewer, uh, new viewer, if in fact you're a new subscriber, a new viewer from the St. Pat's stream, and well, you have your chance now to join the ranks of Chet. Get here in the chat and say whatever you please. I leave the rest of that uh, to the mods. They're good people, all good people here in Chet. Very kind community that we have. Nuke says I'm a newer. That's not true. So the first mountain, Raw Toe. There's Raw Toe. Hello, sir. Get in the truck. We're talking about freaky mountains. And you guys already know that the first one that I'm going to talk about is going to be Mount Shasta. By far the freakiest, or at least the second freakiest, as you'll see. Uh, my hat's off. Yes, to Mr. Scruggs. Right. You caught that, Bill. <laughs> you caught it. I was trying. It's too early for skinny, says Sid. Says, is it? It's ten. It's ten p.m. It's always too early for me, man. This is never going to be easy. Once again, going back to the sudden surge, kind of blow up that we've had here with that last live. The amount of views it's gotten and the amount of subscribers coming in, pushing us right towards the line where I want us to be. I don't know who to thank for that, but I'll tell you right now, it does make you nervous when you see it happening. It does. Especially when you're doing like what I'm doing right now, you're trying to, you're doing a live show as opposed to a pre-recorded one talking about these things that involve so much research you could mess anything up, God only knows. So I watched the Leah fail live a few times trying to figure out what worked about it, if anything. And I still don't know. I can tell you one thing. It was a tight show. Tried to get right down to the point. I'm looking at Mount Shasta right now. Patrick H., well, then this may be a very interesting one for you. I don't envy you because Mount Shasta scares the hell out of me. <laughs> it really does. I suppose I'll go out there. That wouldn't stop me from going out there and looking at it. We love you too, Sid. Yes, that won't stop me from going out to Mount Shasta and having a look. Let's talk about it. Okay. I think that was... Oh, by the way, another thing before we begin. Thank you so much, supporters, who throughout the last two weeks, and of course last weekend we didn't... Once again, we didn't do a broadcast. Thank you so much for coming through with support anyway. It inspired me to to do the show that I'm going to do tonight. It added a little bit of extra kick. You'll see what I mean. We'll have some fun. And it really means a lot. So I want to name uh, those supporters. One, one of whom I can't because they were entirely anonymous. One of these supporters was anonymous and sent an Easter package for the family, some candy and toys even for my youngin and it didn't say who it was from but whoever you are god bless you and keep you we love you thank you for being such a good friend 
And I know that that thrilled my son as well. Moshi Moshi says, uh, drunk wedding photographer, Moshi Moshi, to you, sir. How are you doing? Uh, ah, yes, Ultraman. Guys, I'm not going to let him get away with it. Yep, Ultraman says that it was him. Stakes for Ultraman for being for bringing holiday cheer and Ultraman has such a a good heart guys really a good heart we all know that about Ultraman Ultraman always makes sure that there's it's something for the family it's something wholesome we appreciate you so much Ultraman we we thank you for that and not just um also Kirk Burning came through with support I believe yesterday and um, I was shocked at that and humbled. And so we admire the work of Kirk Burning, who I know has had himself a very hard time and um, recently, and yet still he prevails. Just want you to know, Kirk Burning, if and when you catch this broadcast, how much we love you and appreciate you. So stakes for Kirk Burning, for that matter. What a community we have. And uh, also for uh, Justin, who may or may not be listening, uh, this is not Mr. Schwartz. This is a different Justin who came through with a great deal of support out of the blue yesterday, I think, or the day before, and had made mention, um, was a fr- is, is a friend of, of my wife's, a, co- a co-worker, and had said, I can see why you married him. I could listen to him talk about, I think he said, lawnmower parts or something. I could listen to a guy with a voice like that talk about lawnmower parts. It wouldn't really matter, I think was the gist of his assessment. And I thank you, Justin, if you're listening. Hopefully this is equally listenable. We won't be talking about lawnmower parts, but we will be talking about freaky mountains. This is the Freaky Mountain Breakdown. So yeah, stakes for all those supporters who keep this show alive and getting better and better. Nuke says, I know lawnmower parts. Nuke, you'd be the first person I'd ask. (laughs) All right. So let me get my, my notes and windows and mini tabs here in order. Now, if you were to look up, I guess the most common source of information for people on the internet is, rather unfortunately, Wikipedia. It's always good, I say, to go and read books and check the sources, look at the at the index, the appendices, and so on, and really check your sources when you're looking up stories, because on the internet, a story can be told, and it doesn't have to be sourced at all. You may find sources, some of them dubious, on Wikipedia. But it's not my favorite source of information. However, it's more or less very good for gathering information on places, a basic history of a place, more specifically the geography or geology of a place. So we'll look there for your initial introduction to Mount Shasta because Understanding the dimensions of it and and where it's at and why it's there may help us when we get into the more esoteric parts, which of course are going to involve UFOs and tall people in caves and elves and uh, disappearances, reappearances, portals, strange cloud patterns, uh, Sasquatch, you name it. Shasta has it all. And I might be so bold as to say that it may be the paranormal capital of this entire country. I'm not sure. I haven't been there myself. But I've spent perhaps the last, I think, 13 years or something like that reading about it. Listening to a lot of videos about it. It's a shame how few very high-quality ones there are. Um, Quinn says, going to be a great show. I really hope it is, and I hope you'll stick with us, Quinn. Thank you for being here. Patrick H. says, it's an oddity. It stands alone. Yes, about that. Patrick H., about that. Let's, let's get down to it. 
It is a potentially active volcano, as it reads here, at the southern end of the Cascade Range in Siskiyou County, California, at an elevation of 14,179 feet. For, for those of you who use the metric system, that's 4,321.8 meters. It's the second highest peak in the Cascades and the fifth highest in the state. So that's fifth highest in the state of California. Once again, this is Northern California. California itself, perhaps, a capital of high strangeness in ways both mundane and extraordinary. Mount Shasta has an estimated volume of 85 cubic miles, which makes it the most voluminous stratovolcano in the Cascade Volcanic Arc. The mountain and surrounding area are part of the Shasta Trinity National Forest. Now, um, earlier, who was it had mentioned that? Uh, Patrick H. had mentioned that it stands alone. Yes, it's... Um, the reasons for its location are unclear even to geologists who see it as somewhat of an anomaly, right? When they consider the, the event, because sometimes points in time, uh, geology after all relies heavily on using a point in time as a marker for, uh, for place, for placement, actual location. And you'll hear things like, uh, quote, unquote, we're not sure how it moved out there. And when they say that, what they mean is that they're not sure how the event that caused um, its nearest mountains, what I believe, again, would be the Cascade Range, of why it's so far from the others. And there's really no good explanation for why it happened where it did, which already makes it interesting f from even a a scientific or geological standpoint. When you have something like this that puzzles even the know-it-alls, I say that respectfully and lovingly, then you have something. I'll go on. Let me see what else is here. We're, we're looking at the stats pound for pound of Mount Shasta. Some of this is interesting. I'll continue to read it. Um, it's connected to... it. Uh, its satellite cone of Shastina, and together they dominate the landscape. It rises abruptly to tower nearly 10,000 feet above its surroundings. On a clear winter day, the mountain can be seen from the floor of the Central Valley, 140 miles to the south, etc. Um, Mount Shasta's surface is relatively free of deep glacial erosion, except paradoxically for its south side, where Sargent's Ridge runs parallel to the U-shaped Avalanche Gulch. This is the largest glacial valley on the volcano, although it does not now have a glacier in it. Uh, and there are multiple glaciers in this thing. The, uh, and down in the history, the oldest known human settlement in the area dates to about 7,000 years ago. So there were many tribes there in, in that area. The uh, Shasta, the Aquanu, the, uh, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, the, the Aquanuchu, the Modoc um, Achimawi, I think, would be the pronunciation, maybe. Um, the Karuk, the Klamath, Yana, Wintu. A historic eruption of Mount Shasta in 1786 may have been observed uh, by La Perouse, but this is disputed. Smithsonian Institution's Global Volcanism Program says, oh, here's the Smithsonian again, says that the 1786 eruption is discredited and that the last known eruption of Mount Shasta uh, was around 1250 A.D., proved by uncorrected radiocarbon dating. All right, LOL, but I believe in you, says Ultraman. I was just correcting your grammar. Who, me or somebody else? There's something going on in there? Okay. Lock it down, lock it down. All right, so once again, going back into the I guess what we would call the natural history as opposed to the unnatural history. Celestial, hello to you. I'll catch back up with you guys, Chet. We're going to run this program here. I want to try and, and get through this stuff. Um, although earlier Spanish explorers are likely to have sighted the mountain, the first written record and description was made in May 20th, 1817 by Spaniard Narciso Duran, a member of the Luis 
Antonio Arguello expedition into the upper areas of the Sacramento River Valley, who wrote, quote, At about 10 leagues to the northwest of this place, we saw the very high hill called by soldiers that went near its slope, uh, Jesus Maria. It is entirely covered with snow. And on and on it goes. But here's where we get to the weirder history behind Mount Shasta. In fact, it has its own entry. And uh, off the top of my head, if I were going to talk about it, we could talk about Lemuria, right? I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's comparable to Atlantis, a missing piece of, of Earth, a missing or, or relocated civilization, entire chunk of Earth that supposedly collapsed beneath the waves, much like Atlantis. And one of the... Uh, and Mew, right, Mew being, yes, make mine. So make mine's heard about some of this, or most of it, or all of it. And matter of fact, knowing make mine in 99, I believe make mine could probably host a stream similar to this one and cover all of the relevant uh, facts. Ian says, lemurs are proof of Lemuria. <laughs> Coincidence? Right, Ian, I don't know how you feel about it, but I've always felt like the lemur thing is an odd well, isn't that weird to, to begin to base sort of a pseudo-religion and um, an alternate history? <laughs> lemurs? It all begins with lemurs? I don't know. Let's read this. <clears throat> Legends of Mount Shasta. Quote. Um, the subject of a large number of myths and legends, in particular, it is often said there is a secret city beneath its peaks. In some stories, the city is no longer inhabited, while in others, it is inhabited by a technologically advanced society of human beings or mythical creatures. That's not limited to just human beings or mythical creatures. That's editorial from me. Apparently, we also, again, have Sasquatch, elves, aliens, Nephilim, and everything else in between. Um, according to local indigenous tribes, namely the Klamath people, Mount Shasta is inhabited by the spirit chief Skell, who descended from heaven to the mountain's summit. Guys, this may begin to sound familiar if you've read any stories, if you've read the Bible, for instance, uh, or if you've read some of these those things perhaps omitted from the King James Version of the Bible, the Book of Enoch, where it's said that uh, Mount Hermon is the place where some of the angels fell. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, but I'm already seeing here an interesting kind of uh, similarity between these two stories. One from natives over here and then another in biblical times from the Middle East. Skell fought with the spirit of the below world. Uh, Lao, who res resided at Mount Mazama by throwing hot rocks and lava, probably representing the volcanic eruptions at both mountains. Writer Joaquin Miller recorded various related legends in the 1870s. Now let's talk about Mount Mazama. It's a, it seems to be, when you look at it, for instance, if you look at it, uh, if you look at a satellite image of it, it looks like a giant crater, uh, a caldera, boiling lake, which is interesting, and it almost mirrors Shasta. So the indigenous peoples at this time saw these two mountains as fighting with each other, waging war with each other, because these uh, gods resided in each one. Now before we start getting our head full of uh, thunderbirds and UFOs and all of that wonderful, mystical, my mysterious stuff that you hear coming from that area, especially that area. Before we go there, let's look inside the mountains where perhaps things are even creepier. So you have the idea of this city, a lost city inside the mountain called Talos. <laughs> And this is going to get weird. I'll tell you where these stories come from momentarily. These are people from Lemuria. 
Again, you just kind of got to go with that because there's a group of people who believe various groups sometimes referring to themselves as ascended masters and things like that. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, folks. Who claim that Lemuria, or rather its, its refugees, went and built a city inside of Shasta. Now, people who are fans of Hollow Earth theory get into this kind of thing quite a lot. I'll continue. The legend grew from an offhand mention of Lemuria in the 1880s. In 1899, Frederick Spencer Oliver published A Dweller on Two Planets, which claimed that survivors from a sunken continent called Lemuria were living in or on Mount Shasta. Oliver's Lemurians lived in a complex system of tunnels beneath with jeweled walls and fur-carpeted floors within the mountain and occasionally were seen walking the surface dressed in white robes. Mr. Politis, with the, the missing 411 story, is one of the most interesting ones I ever heard out of his neck of the woods, no pun intended, haha, is the one about the robot grandma. I don't know any other way to describe it. The young boy who was, who was missing. We've touched on this one before. I think it's the strangest story coming off of Shasta. And um, <clears throat> he, was, he was told to, um, <laughs> to provide a stool sample. Again, this is his story. This was a very young boy. As a dad, it, it scares the hell out of me. I have a young boy myself who was um, older even than this poor boy who disappeared. But he came back, he came back, but he was directed by someone who appeared to be his grandmother, and it wasn't. He said that he knew that it wasn't, and then later on, they found out, that, or the grandmother, the real grandmother, says, well, she had had an episode two weeks prior where she felt something like a pinprick in the back of her neck, and then she passes out, right? <laughs> and later on, you have this boy disappear. He says he went into a cave and saw her there, but she wasn't herself. She was something else. Maybe something like these doll people that John A. Keel would talk about. The fake grandma. Right, skinwalker, says Ian. Gotta put tinfoil hats on, says my wife. Patrick H. says, it's in the Oreos. Rato says, uh, grape, grape drink, no. Yeah, don't drink the Kool-Aid. So, there's all kinds of UFO activity around this place, and this goes back to the indigenous legends. There's an interesting thing that d didn't just occur here, but, but that you'll hear in a number of other native legends about not exceeding the tree line. Don't go past the tree line. Because that at that point, on a, on a high mountain, on a peak, on a pinnacle, once you're past the tree line, you're in the domain of the sky people. And it's been, it was always maintained that way. Raggedy Ann, hello to you. She says, happy mid-Saturday. I'm going to make sure that it's an extra Saturday. How about that? And they would discuss Thunderbirds which to me is one of the more, another one of the more terrifying things that I think about. When, if you guys wanted to know what freaks me out, usually it's uh, talk of mountains, Nephilim, Thunderbirds, that very esoteric sort of biblical stuff that goes beyond just the flying saucer, even though there's plenty of those to go around here at, at Mount Shasta which we're still talking about. Let me keep moving on. There have been many, many Bigfoot sightings. So it's a cryptozoology hotspot over there. You have some cults that have formed around the mountain. And that's not unusual either, right? Whether you want to talk about, um, let's say... 
Canaanite stuff in the Middle East, or, or Sumer, early, really early stuff over in the Middle East, or over here. Obviously, these mountains played a serious role in people's perception of spirituality. It's also a symbol of death, the mountain. Now, I, I wish I could pull it up here. You guys remember that weird Travis Scott concert? Which was tragic as well. I mean, people lost their lives and he was chanting. Um, he had his vocoder on and was just chanting or something while they were passing um, people who had passed away along, trying to get them medical attention and so on. And everyone claimed to have gotten an awful feeling and that the whole thing was negative. There was just this awful feeling around all of it. And indeed there was. I looked at the footage and I said, well, there's symbolism going on here that is typically not for the amateur. If you guys want to go look at the footage from that Travis Scott concert, what was being depicted behind him? A giant mountain. And within it, within the base of it, right? Um, this pit with an eyeball blinking watchful eyeball inside of the mountain, deep inside of the mountain. And that was the imagery that was chosen. As a matter of fact, some of the other stuff, t-shirts, I think, that were being sold and um, other promotional, various promotional stuff of these, of regular people walking through a flaming portal or something like that and coming out on the other end with horns and things like that. Even now, whether that was an actual strange paranormal event or not, the whole Travis Scott thing. It was There was cer certainly a lot of occ occultism, occult imagery that went into it. And so I'm trying, I'm going to draw, you know, a, a parallel between that kind of mainstream imagery and then this more esoteric stuff. And really it's the same thing. So you go, why? Well, we don't know why. But mountains are, are creepy. <laughs> They're creepy just by their existence. I thought about some of this yesterday while I was preparing for this stream. In fact, I prepared for this one uh, for, for a while now. Again, we had a hiatus, so I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I was thinking about why mountains are so creepy. And one of, one of those things, I think, one of the reasons, is because they seem to be the one thing that we can't dominate. The one piece of nature that we can't conquer. Yeah, you can drill all these wormholes in it and look for gold and, and try and blast it out. But that takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. And yes, there are mountains that are being unjustly blasted right now, some in Oregon that I hear about, um, or deforested where they shouldn't be, maybe, right? Um, but regardless, it's it seems to represent the thing that we can't conquer, the place where we don't belong, perhaps. Just as frightening as the bottom of the ocean, which also scares the hell out of me. Now, some, some strange characters have popped up around Shasta and its legends. And I, while speaking about these cults, I may as well speak about these people. Um, among these cults or um, groups, whatever you may <laughs> you want to call them, the I am activity. And this began, I think, in the 20s. Let me check. Um, I'm sorry, the 30s. Yeah, by Guy Ballard and his wife Edna Ann Wheeler Ballard in Chicago, Illinois. It's a long ways away from Mount Shasta. But it's not lost on me that around that same time, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was operating in Chicago at that time, uh, as well as many other major cities. And many of these people who went on to create their own smaller groups were influenced by folks like uh, Arthur Waite and Helena Blavatsky. The usual, the usual suspects, the usual wizards, if that's what one wanted to call them. Um, 
the I am activity is was just one among many of a lot of these different groups who acknowledged the idea of the existence of these people who called themselves the ascended masters. Now, if you look into Golden Dawn's bag, these people would have been called the Secret Chiefs, which is also a really good band. Secret Chiefs 3. I like Secret Chiefs 3, anyway. But yeah, the, um, so they were also referred to as the Secret Chiefs, Ascended Masters, whatever you want to call them. Now, do I think any of it was real? I have no idea. I tend to check out once a guy shows up referring to himself as an ascended master or that he understands something that I don't or he's asking me, are you lonely? Do you feel misunderstood? Well, take this pamphlet, sir, and come with me. I'm not going. No. No. I'll go look at the mountain. How about that? I'll look at it and I'll come to my own conclusions. God forbid I see a creepy UFO or an elf or Sasquatch. If I saw something that interesting, hell, if I saw one Squatch, and I really would like to, if I saw one Squatch, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to join a movement or a group. I'd, go, I'd screw off and go, I'd live on the side of that mountain in a cabin, <laughs> and I'd never have to do anything or talk to anyone again. I'd be like, well, it's settled. It's settled. Sasquatch is real. I'd toast to it every day. So, and it doesn't end there. Even stranger characters began to appear around the, the Shasta hysteria of the early 20th century. Now, one of these was an individual you may have heard of before, um, considered sort of a mystery figure, not unlike John Titor or Indrid Cold. This individual was, any guesses, Chet? This individual's name was Valiant Thor. And there are plenty of YouTube videos about <laughs> Valiant Thor. They're all more or less very entertaining. Valiant Thor <laughs> is a uh, is a strange character. I'll read to you because there's not an, an actual Wikipedia article. Instead, on there's a wiki, one of these small smaller like fan wikis. There's an entry on Valiant Thor. Um this was an individual... Now, from what I understand, by the way, Valiant Thor has appeared in popular media, even, that there have been <laughs> cartoon characters, and and I guess he has appeared in television shows as a character, but that not a lot of people realize this comes out of an actual event in history, or this character. Anyway, this strange man... I'll read, this is from an article from uh, Tiln, T-I-L-L-N dot com, an article titled Valiant Thor, the alien who lived in the Pentagon. And I'll, this connects back to Shasta, and I'll tell you guys how and why here in a moment. Valiant Thor is the subject of a truly unbelievable story. We mean it. Um, let me, if there's an editorial here. Let me uh, move on. Uh, oops, let me get that out of the way as well. Come on now. Get out of my way. <laughs> pop-ups. This <laughs> pop up The pop-up in this case has 41 normal things in Japan. It's showing me a picture of, any, of something that's anything but normal. So, um, in March 1957... Basically, I'll just wing it here. Since I can't read this part, it's blocked by a, a, a pop-up. You have this UFO, a flying saucer, or, or craft, land somewhere near Alexandria. And police came out there and everything. And this guy pops out. He says he needs to speak with President Eisenhower. And supposedly they take him to the Pentagon. And then he tries to talk about why we should get rid of nukes. 
And hit the like button, says Make Mine a 99. Please do. It helps. I've learned that it does. He, yeah, as Nuke says, he even spoke to Congress, LOL. It's a funny story. It's weird. According to the mission of Valiant Thor. Here, let's read this part. According to Valiant Thor, he was sent here by a galactic council to convince... <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> he was sent here by a... <laughs> I wonder if he had a Nike sponsorship. <clears throat> to convince humanity to shy away from their use of nuclear weapons. Well, that's an admirable pursuit. Val and his group of alien assistants hailed from the nearby planet of Venus. <clears throat> These aliens were humanoid in appearance with a single discrepancy of six fingers on each hand. Um, <laughs> Val convinced President Eisenhower to create a council against the use of nuclear weapons. However, the committee was repeatedly blocked by members of the CIA and DOD. Again, this is all according to this article. When it became clear that the office of the president could not deliver the results for which he came, Val turned to evangelist Frank Stranges. Okay, now once we... So Valiant Thor has a funny story, but then once you start to look at Frank Stranges, and... Um, <laughs> Who was it? Uh, these the other folks uh, from Chicago. Um, Guy Ballard. Okay, it it's not dissimilar to Guy Ballard. Although Frank Stranges was a Bible reading man. Now it's religious, says Make Mine. I know it's funny. The weird overlap. Sometimes there is. Often there is an overlap between the paranormal, the religious. There are some who may argue it's all the same thing, and if you're enjoying tonight's program, boy, are you really going to enjoy it when we get to the the second segment of tonight's program. Because it has everything to do with that. So, uh, let's get back to it. Frank Stranges. He was an evangelist. He had just done a book. He was writing a book about um, the quote-unquote alien, or biblically, the angelic encounter in the book of Ezekiel. The wheel within a wheel, right? That, um, it was rimmed with eyes. Each of the wheels had these many eyes on them, and so on. And, and he was writing this when he met Valiant Thor. Uh, it says here, quote, Val taught strangers about the validity of some theories and about what God thought of humanity, quickly Frank Stranges was campaigning for Val. It appeared that since the alien couldn't use Eisenhower for his purposes, he would uh, choose to use an author instead. So the problem with this, guys, is that our only source is this book that was written by Frank Stranges. And spoiler alert, it caught on. You can, there's tons of con content as a result about Valiant Thor. Now I'm not saying it didn't happen. I have no idea but once again, when you have a civilian suddenly proclaim that they have the answer, capital T, capital A, you know, just wear a little bit of extra tinfoil on your, on your head. So, um, now, why did I bring up, you didn't hear any mention at all, right, about Shasta? At all. Well, there, <laughs> there's something I want to read to you guys. This is from a book about Shasta. This is supposedly a quote from Valiant Thor in 1982. Quote, Ever since Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, mountains have been an awe-inspiring symbol of power to be reverently beheld and at times even worshipped by mortal man. Not content to merely play a role in man's culture, sometimes mountains seem to take on a personality all their own, choosing to control man's destiny by spewing forth their molten lava, silencing man, and reshaping his world. Keep in mind, if you're just tuning in, we're supposedly hearing the words of Valiant Thor, who may or may not have existed, and Valiant Thor's thoughts on Mount Shasta. Mount Vesuvius swallowed up Pompeii 
and some seers today predict that its future major eruption will signal the submerged continent of Atlantis to arise from the murky depths and resume its once dominant presence on our Earth. Mount Pele has twice devastated the island of Martinique, and more recently Mount St. Helens spread her dark blanket of clouds, ashes, and smoke throughout Washington state and surrounding states in several spectacles of the rage of nature on man. Some traditional Hawaiian natives believe in the existence of the volcano goddess Pele and actually rejoice when any one of their Hawaiian volcanoes uh, erupts. Immediate airplane flights are scheduled over the exploding volcanoes, accommodating the hundreds of people. This doesn't sound like the writings, by the way, of a guy who just stepped out of a flying saucer, but it is all very nice, guys. It, it reads sort of like um, Mr. Fort, <laughs> like how he wrote. Accommodating the hundreds of people who long to look into the bowels of the earth from a bird's eye view. Film producer and director Steven Spielberg chose Devil's Mountain in Wyoming. That's not suspicious. As the location, the extraterrestrials would contact humans in his film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So apparently Valiant Thor was a fan of Steven Spielberg. He... Man seems to have an inner... And when you know, you know. Man seems to have an inner urge to climb and, quote, conquer mountains, be it Half Dome in Yosemite National Park or, for the more daring, Mount Everest which beckons generation after generation to attempt to reach its summit without falling to their death. What magical powers do mountains wield over man? What fascination do we find in them? I'll take a break there, because boy, does uh, Valiant Thor have a lot to say. <laughs> for a book, for the foreword to this book. Um, Patrick H. says, I thought uh, Pele was a soccer player. I think so. I think that's also true. Patrick H., a soccer player, football player, if you were in the U.K. or in Europe. Let's continue with what Valiant Thor supposedly said about Shasta in 1982. Like a magnet, Mount Shasta continually draws thousands from every part of the globe to its cloud-shrouded slopes each year. As more people become aware of its legends and hear of its mysterious occurrences. They yearn to unlock its secrets, to become a part of its magic. Excuse me. Um, it might be called the Mount Olympus of California, the home of the ancient gods, the Atlanteans and Lemurians. So I'm going to stop here. Valiant Thor clearly is acknowledging the old human cults and myths and religions which again I guess you know he had just stepped a, did he step off the flying saucer and stay this is 1982 we're talking about here alright moving on Mount Shasta stands out as the pinnacle of all mountain peaks to students of occultism ufology mysticism and ancient folklore it is regarded almost as a shrine uh, a common spiritual ground to which all who value truth seek perfection we're going to get through this chat and enlightenment can assemble to receive mutual spiritual growth and cosmic awareness thousands come to witness the I am activity pageant in the town of Mount Shasta annually the Rosicrucians are another occult group who frequents the mountain oh I don't doubt that for one moment but it is the strange phenomena seen, heard, and felt by countless individuals whose tales of their experiences spread like wildfire that draw yet more people who dare to attempt to unravel its tangled web of intricate secrets. Just what are some of the unbelievable sights, sounds, and experiences felt and adventures undergone by individuals that have changed their lives forever, you ask? Bruce Walton has admirably undertaken an enormous task of revealing some of those very things to the reader in this marvelous work of dedication. <laughs> With great love and care, he has assembled a collection of the best eyewitness accounts, legends, adventures, and stories that have transformed the lives of those who experienced them. Unquote. These are supposedly, again, the words of Valiant Thor, 1982. Wow, so let me catch back up with you, Chet. <laughs> After all that reading, let's do some some listener and, and audience participation here. 
about all this. I don't mean to laugh. I really don't. And I'm not... I'm not grumpy. I already told you guys, I believe that there's something that goes on with Mount Shasta. I think that there is something paranormal about it. I think there are many, many things that are paranormal about it that exceed the paranormal and then go right into the parapsychological and then exceed that and get down into the existential. It's a scary place to me. And and no, I wouldn't be surprised if I encountered a UFO (laughs) there. So, uh, let's see what Chet has to say. I learned how to water ski on a Lake Shasta as a child, says Petey. Um, You guys talking about the Rosicrucians? They're basically a book club these days. I know, trust me. Harmless. Book club. Um, Rato says, rule number one. Never take lava rock home from Hawaiian islands. Bad juju. Yeah, oh, we all know that one. We already know. You may end up with a raw toe, right, toe? Let's see. Who else is... uh, Skinny, I lava you. I love you too, Petey. (laughs) Oh, punny. Patrick H. Yeah, talking about the laser beams. Oh, Lord. Those are showing up a lot lately. The laser beams. Maybe we'll talk about them on another stream. When I, when I find a video that doesn't look hoaxed, because somebody took a sound effect of Mecha Ghidorah and put it in one of the TikTok videos when you hear the laser, and I'm like, wait a minute, I have the Criterion Godzilla collection. That's the sound effect. That's Mecha Ghidorah. That one sound effect. That's weird. <laughs> Sorry. Hate to burst the bubble on that one. Nuke, uh, redeeming a Nuke Nuts advertisement. Let's see if it comes through. Nuke. Yeah. That'll be enough of that, Eric. Seriously, mods. Mods, mods! (laughs) Keep it orderly in there. (laughs) We're trying to be intellectual, damn it! So, yeah. Um... Shasta's got it all for you. There are many videos about it. There are many that go... Look at that. Mods right on top of it. Thank you. You know my heart. You know my heart, Mods. I love you and appreciate you. I'll take you with me wherever I go. Hopefully one day I can pay you. I'm serious. We're taking over, right? Road to 1K, as Megmine keeps saying. <laughs> yeah. So, um... Toe, we're going to change that one. You said you didn't want one before, if memory serves, so we honored that, but I'd love to give one to you. Uh, Speaking of hearts, the heart in chat drives me loco. Oh, tapping the screen, tapping the screen. Yeah. Especially while we're out here asking questions, questions, questions. Let's get to another freaky mountain, my friends. (laughs) <laughs> You're going to be rewarded for staying here for this one. Let's get to another freaky mountain. Now, this one is one uh, that I personally find freaky. That'd be the uh, King's Pinnacle. In it's, it's on the border, North Carolina, South Carolina. King's Pinnacle is a weird place. I don't know how many of you have seen the videos of UFOs, flying saucer, or, or unidentified aerial phenomena that come out of that region. There's quite a lot of it. The gelatinous ones, the... I mean, everything. There was a giant cube. There's a video of a huge cube. There's one that, I guess, was comparable to a plastic bag floating through the air, except it was giant, and it was floating through the sky. Ribeye Steak asks, what about Walton's Mountain? I don't have that one here in my notes ribeye and I like your name I love your name by the way Uh, because I love steak but yeah uh, Walton's Mount I'll have to look into that you're not referring to uh, let me well we've got the internet at our disposal hold on I've got time we do this uh, we do this thing for you guys okay I see a oh in Virginia okay now would this be Oh, wow. Where's the real Walton's Mountain? Oh, so that's connected to the show, The Waltons? <laughs> okay. Uh, it doesn't say whether that was built on the real 
there is like a real Walton's Mountain. I don't. I'll have to look more into that. That's funny. Are there UFO sightings out there? Patrick H. throwing up stakes for uh, maybe for ribeye, right? Nice name. Francesca, hello to you. And if there's any of you I've missed, Adam S., love to see you every time. Um, if there's any of you I've, I've missed, hopefully you'll stick with me. I'll catch uh, up with you again here at the end of this thing. Oh, and some of you are having safety meetings. I like the energy tonight, and I hope that you guys will appreciate <laughs> I brought Alert Box back for here on the at the campfire. Once again, if you're a new subscriber, a new viewer, I know there's many of you. God bless you and keep you. Thank you. I hope you live a thousand years, each one of you. Thank you for coming over to our side, uh, for subscribing to this channel. I appreciate it. It makes me feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, flamethrower. I need to get rid of flamethrower. Yeah, a few alerts. Get them out of your system, and then we'll continue, guys. <laughs> if you'll please. Get those redeemables. Yes, we have them. You can type in a little magic words, and these funny things pop up. We'll add a few more over time. But we put the fun in paranormal. <laughs> uh, no, wait. <laughs> I had something. No, we put the T in Fortian. Huh? You like that? Because I've switched from coffee to tea lately, Chet. I'm trying to save my life. Flamethrower special occasion. Right, thank you, Ultraman. Do your gerb, says Celestial, and indeed we will. Um, King's Pinnacle is an interesting place. A lot of, that one creeps me out. I've, I've, I ride by it a lot when I'm on the road. There's not a single time I don't look at it at night and feel, you know, a little spooked out by it, knowing what I know or expecting that I might see a UFO or something over over there over that way superstition mountains for an entirely different reading although there are plenty of UFO sightings and ghost sightings in that area those of course are in the Phoenix metropolitan area of Arizona they have a cool um, mystery associated with them the lost I think it was the lost Dutchman's mine am I hold on let me pull up my notes Lost Dutchman? I don't want to get that confused with the Flying Dutchman. No, it is Lost Dutchman. Yeah, the Lost Dutchman's gold mine, which is itself an entire mystery that you guys can look into. But the reason I mention that one here, we have a similar legend. You guys are going to see a theme begin to appear. Um, and this one belongs to the Apaches in the area. Uh, some Apaches believe that the hole leading down into the lower world, or hell, or... Hell, goodness gracious, is located in the Superstition Mountains. Winds blowing from the hole are supposed to be the cause of severe dust storms in the metropolitan region. Um, and I've seen a number of uh, message board posts about people who've had ghostly experiences in that area and so I included that here because you you do also have ghostly encounters over around Shasta so here we're gonna get to Shasta being one of the the big ones here we're gonna get to the the OG at least biblically and that would be Mount Hermon yes Mount Hermon which is a lot like Shasta has a lot on it in the Bible. It's mentioned um, passively. It's mentioned casually in the Song of Solomon. Uh, I think there's uh, something about uh, Solomon's wife, which that's kind of a spicy book, very romantic, I guess, the polite term for Song of Solomon, of his wife descending from the mountain. Uh, it's, it's where El, which was at that time a, a word for God of course for the Almighty held court uh, this was a Semitic God at that time uh, known to the ancient world and this is a from actually this is a religious site but it has very good information uh, all pro pastors international uh, not only is the secret dwelling place of, of the Anunnaki right a mountain of divine assembly uh, and place of the fallen angels 
right? Uh, the Bene Elohim. So all kinds of stuff. It's also said to be the gateway to tar uh, Tartarus. Now remember, that's supposed to be below Hades. So already there's a really dark, <laughs> I mean really dark, scary history behind this mountain. So El Shaddai, you, you see that one mentioned, right? Well, it, it said that that means God of the Mountain. Now remember when I told you about native legends revolving around Shasta? Or you could even go and look at the Superstition Mountains and see the same among the Apache. So drawing this, pulling this thread here between these different mountains and the fact that they're all associated with being like homes for the Almighty, and they also happen to be places where you see tons of UFO activity. Over at Shasta, there are people who say they see UFOs fly right into it, as in right into it. Not into an opening or, or a, a porthole or a hole in the mountain, but in fact just, just going right through it in a ghostly sort of way. Well... When it comes to Mount Hermon, I think I've brought this up before, one of the antipodes, which is a, a geographical opposite, right? The, the opposite side of the world, precisely, an antipode. Um, Mount Hermon has one, and guess what it is? Roswell, New Mexico. I think if I'm remembering that correctly, because that was from another stream. That's, that's the antipode to Mount Hermon, Roswell, New Mexico. So I did a little bit of research and I said, well, if that's if Roswell is the antipode to Mount Hermon, which is very, very interesting, well, then Shasta, where it's claimed that people see UFOs flying into the mountain without any opening, right? As if they could pass right through the rock. Think about the track with me, Chet. Um, then what would be the antipode of Mount Shasta. And when I found it, it, it seemed boring only at first. It's uh, in, the, in the South Indian Ocean, way down there, when you start to get into the Antarctic regions, right? It, it just so happens that um, someone, if, if one of you guys are fast on the draw, the longest linear crack in the earth, or the longest linear shelf, as in a straight line, is in this region, okay, let me pull it up, because it's somewhere near the island, uh, or Isle de uh, Possession, so let me pull that up real quick, sorry guys, my memory's failing me a little bit, and so I need to pull up, I need to refresh it with some of this stuff, um, yeah, Possession Island. It's in the sub-Antarctic uh, Crozet Archipelago. Or Archipelago. Sorry, I'm doing a lot of reading. Part of the French Southern and Antarctic lands. So it seems... It would all seem very boring. Except... Uh, the, the antipode, again, to Shasta... This region of the Earth has the longest... The uh, linear crack in the Earth shelf near Australia, uh, and it's called the uh, 19th, uh, one moment, let me pull that one up, uh, uh, hold on, one moment guys, just a moment, we're taking it easy, no, it's not the Rowley shelf, I know that the number uh, 19 is associated, has someone got that one for me? We, I may find it here if I just go ahead and, and pull up the, um, yeah, one of you guys got it. What's that thing called? <laughs> oh, me. I've failed. <laughs> I have failed, Chet. I can't find it. <laughs> the, is it the 19th Meridian? Okay. There's also, well, there's, and there's another, there's another name for it. It's, it's a, some, a somewhat mundane sounding name. Um, it almost sounds like a club that you would hang out at. 
what is this thing called? Yeah, well, we'll go with the 19th meridian. Indonesia one? No, I think it's for, it. well, yeah, it's not far from Indonesia, Celestial. And it's very, you can see it when you look at these satellite images that actually show the, the geography under the waves, under the ocean. You can see it. It's huge. It's a, it's a straight line. And um, so the island that the Antipode of Shasta is very near to may or may not have been one of the inspirations behind Edgar Allan Poe's um, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, which I have read. I own a copy of it from 1932. It's in pristine condition, Chet, by the way. I love my books. But yeah, that, um, which in turn inspired At the Mountains of Madness. Are we seeing a theme here by H.P. Lovecraft? Anyway, the, the Isle of Possession, if I remember correctly, there was a, a crew that got shipwrecked there. And uh, they were never found, although they were, ab they were able to successfully tie a note to the leg of a heron. And then that heron showed up in Australia, and someone actually recovered that note. Well, they went out there, and there was no trace of the people who had been stranded there. Now, it could easily be they all just went nuts, and then the last one among them rolled everybody else into the ocean or whatever. But that is pretty interesting. So, when you see a funny place, look at the antipode. Figure out what's on the exact opposite side of it. It, it did come to my mind that we do have a rather amazing geological feature in the crust of the planet Earth and damn it if I'm not if I'm still not trying to look for it I'm, I mean I'm typing longest linear continental shelf <laughs> near Australia etc and it and even though uh, we have a decent name for it the ninth the 19th meridian um, I'm I'm not able to find uh, it's called, like, uh, 19 South or, so, or something like that. So, yeah. We'll get a correction, I'm sure, in the comments. By the way, our last one was so... Cannibalism is a mother trucker, says Patrick H. Yeah, I kind of thought... I figured that that's what probably ended up happening on that island. So there we go. We've talked about Freaky Mountains tonight, Chet. I suppose we could talk about a few more, but I have a, a treat, a surprise for you guys. Now, before we get into that, because it is Easter, so I needed to do something for you guys for Easter, and, and that meant having a, a little show, having some content in the way that only this channel does, perhaps. Again, we like to have fun with this weird stuff. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention before, so many nice comments and reviews, like, uh, like this one from E.Z. Smith on the Leah Fail one says... Um, the, the talker, what is it? The speaker guy at 945 is triggered. Or something like that. I think it's... <laughs> and that is a wonderful review. Uh, once again, yeah, at 945, the talker guy become triggered. So I had to check that out. And it was during the story about my early ancestor. With the, the, the taters thing. Uh, thank you for enjoying the stream, Easy Smith. We love you and appreciate you. Get in the truck. Because where are we going? We're going to Easter Town. That's right, guys. It's that time. <laughs> Press Juan if we're ready to go, Chet. This is your... It's your time to shine. This is Chet participation time. Press Juan if you're ready to go there. And then see what our plans were for Easter here on this channel. I hope that you'll enjoy it. Yeah. We're going to go into a different studio for this one. Are we ready? All right. Let's do it. You know what time it is. Or do you? It's toast to toast time. Pardon me. Let's try that again. Toast to toast, toast, to toast. time. Anyway, this is the, uh, the stupidest paranormal program east of the Smokies. And, oh, Mommy, please let me host it. Oh, I can? Thank you. I'm Skinny White, paranormal researcher, card-carrying mystery merchant, 
and amateur folklorist suffering from ADHD. What? I like this part. So this is basically the Easter broadcast, and I wanted to spend some time talking about Easter and uh, maybe some of the origins of iconography associated with it, but there's no easy way to do it, you see, because it could make people upset, right? <laughs> yes, there are folks out there right now who are upset, apparently about the decision of UK chocolatiers to suddenly refer to the Easter egg as a gesture egg. And while folks are arguing, perhaps rightfully, that this is at least ridiculous and at most uh, an insult, well, Cadbury says they have nothing to do with it. It was an independent store. They claim they have no plans to replace the Easter egg with the gesture egg and blame it solely on the store in Spalding. So here to talk about it with us is the ghost of 20th century mystic and ethnobotanist, Terrence McKenna. Yes, hello. It is my pleasure to have you here, sir. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, it's a treat uh, to have you here to talk about this conflagration over the Cadbury chocolate egg slash, what was it? I forgot it already. Gesture. Egg? That's right. Yeah, the gest the gesture egg. Let's do it. Let's go. Well, I'd like to begin by saying it's very apropos for you to summon me here to talk yeah. about something that I see <laughs> time and time again, which is this uh, human instinct to say, yes, sir. wait, we're doing it over. Words have become so harmful that we have to create more of them, mm. <laughs> naturally. Yeah, yeah. Or repurpose them. Or repurpose them, right? Like everything. Like everything. Sure, but if this is about words, which it is, right. then you have to remember that words are sort of a magic spell that we use in utterance. For instance, uh, talking about the repurposing of a word espoused in you an immediate feeling that everything is repurposed. Mm -hmm. Well, now consider your usage of the word. Everything. 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 Well, then you're implying that there's an absolute. Let me fix my mic. But, <clears throat> but, okay, sorry. But when you say that it is repurposed, well, do you mean everything, or do you mean the word everything? Mm. It doesn't matter, because this is an acknowledgement of the absolute. Are words meaningless, then? Well, what's your definition like, of the word meaningless? My definition. You said my definition. Your definition. You're suggesting is different from yours. It might be. I feel like I'm talking to a sphinx. <laughs> why am, well, why am I sweating? Now let's talk about A. <laughs> now you were talking about this Cadbury egg right. fiasco in England and uh, the gesture egg. Gesture egg. And in this case it sounds like gesture is an adjunct to symbol. Right. How is a gesture different from a symbol? Well, it isn't. Right. In other words, they're saying, please accept this symbol egg. Well, then that would mean that it symbolizes something, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what exactly, but uh, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> Make of it what you will. Or don't. Or don't question it, right? Here's a gesture egg. Don't question it. I'm sorry. Here's a gesture egg well as they say today uh if you know you know uh thusly what is the gesture right what are we doing here at this point the word mm. is to the symbol as the gesture is to the symbol words and gestures are just symbols and this is a very interesting and very strange uh moment in linguistics however small and inconsequential it can be, that is, as far as anyone can perceive, this is an argument in front of a convenience store. And by the very nature of the absurdity of it, 
we can't even begin to approach the well, the obvious hand at play here, which is perhaps to draw attention to the fact that uh, most, if not all, of this symbolism comes from Sumerian cuneiform and cults of Ishtar, Ishtar. and Eostra, variously called Inanna. A lot of this is going back to Gilgamesh and his particular scene. Mm. One of Ishtar's symbols was an eight-pointed star. I always found this interesting. If you look on the Cadbury egg, there's an eight-pointed star on it. No, no, <laughs> you'll do well to remember that this is a gesture mm. egg, but... Gesture uh, egg. My question is, uh, how should we refer to the bunny? It, uh, clearly the gesture bunny. Or the symbol, the symbol bunny. And well, don't you think it's a little silly that undoubtedly there would be some uh, religious types who would feel that if the Easter bunny were deleted, then uh, it would be an attack on their religion. Yeah, I've, I've already seen it's it. It's very That's strange. why we're doing this one. <laughs> it's, it's, where does the Easter bunny come from? What does that have the to do? The symbolism behind the bunny. The hair is a part of uh, fertility goddess iconography. Right. Fertility. And so is the eight-pointed star. Once again, this is the symbol of Ishtar. And it's right there on the Cadbury egg. And yet people are uh, discussing whether or not it should be called an Easter egg. Ishtar egg. Or Aostra egg. Or an Inanna egg. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> or a gesture egg. Gesture egg. Right, and so now let's talk about the repurposing or recycling right. of these uh, symbols. Any scholar of ancient religion uh, might suggest that it's happened already many times. Right, the equinox, etc. You know, first it was Ishtar. It and, goes all the way back to Babylon. And then later you end up with uh, Eostra. Of Saxony. Right. Yeah. In the Germanic version of events, or and, and later on the, the Anglo-Saxon version M of Mr. Events. McKenna, we have, uh, I have another caller here. You'll have to stick with me on this, because this gentleman claims to be the Easter Bunny. Oh, delightful. Once again, you're listening to Toast to Toast. I am your host, Skinny White, uh, on the phone currently with the ghost of Mr. Terrence McKenna. Thank you. But we have an additional caller. Easter Bunny, you are on the air. Yes, I'm here. Is everything coming through clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm, I am? Absolutely. I'm coming through clearly. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I suppose my first question is, uh, if none of you hacks mm -hmm. can come to a decision on what an Easter egg is, then what the hell am I doing sprinting around at 10,000 miles per hour, delivering the well, damn thing. Well, that's what we're trying to figure that's out. Your, right. We are sitting there trying to figure it out. That's right. I know we I have to do it. You have to... Have you to have do to do what? it? You have to do what? You have no idea what I have to do. No, sir. I and don't. I don't have time to figure it out. I don't have any time to look at these things. Okay. But I do have to make sure that everybody gets one. You see? Gets an Easter egg? Easter egg, gesture egg, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter what you... I'm shitting these things out by the second. Yikes. Thousands of... Many, many, many thousands of them. Yeah. It's painful. I can imagine. Anybody who thinks that these eggs are coming from chickens, men, are they in for a shock? Well, there is some veracity no, to that. No, Terrence, I don't want to hear from you anymore. You're a damn federal agent. I don't want no, to hear whoa. anymore from you. Whoa. Uh, all right, let's calm down. Well, I was going to say... Well, repurposing. It's like they repurposed Mr. Rogers. That damn. Um, talk of the rabbit laying the egg is not unsubstantiated. No, it isn't unsubstantiated. That's correct, because I just told you. No, I'm no. over around here laying the eggs. I'm doing it right now. God. All yeah. right. I think... All right. Uh, to continue... Go on. Go on and with And it. it seems that our friend here <clears throat> may be caught up <clears throat> in a particular rap I call a uh, fierce or... Uh, aggressive agreement. Aggressive. Make your case, man. Oh, my God. Why am I sweating? The rumored cults of uh, Eostra... It's like talking to a sphinx. That's what I said. ...amongst Saxony... Mm -hmm. ...told a story in which she turned a dove into a rabbit... ...though it continued to lay eggs. 
Mr. McKenna. Yes, Mr. Thompson. I, I mean that. Easter Bunny. In the time that it took for you to say that, I just laid 125,000 eggs. Wow. And I am on the run once again. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Easter Bunny, it sounds very stressful. Oh, yeah, stressful is an understatement. It's a nightmare. These, uh... Well... Quiet, Terrence. Let's keep it cool. There's a time and a place for you, man. And there's a time and a place for me. Oh, absolutely. These, uh... These things are made of plastic. The eggs? These the... crazy eggs. Are you eating right now? No, shit, are man. I'm, I'm eating an egg. A re uh, I don't have any time, <laughs> A man. regular egg or one, or one of your own? I can't stop for regular eggs. Yeah. It's like being an Amazon <laughs> driver or something. So the pattern of your existence is a, a mighty weird one, yes. Easter Bunny. Yes, it's a nightmare. I anyway, what was I saying? Oh, I delivered your uh, your Easter basket already. You should Easter, have it. Easter basket. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Yeah. No, yes. I thought I saw it. Oh, my. Yeah. Easter magic. Oh, cool. Bunny magic. Yeah. The suspense is killing me. Of course yeah. it is. That was a joke. Oh, that was a... Oh, because okay. Because I'm, I'm not alive. <laughs> I get it. Oh, I'm funny. Hip. I'm he's a funny bastard. Well, it looks like there's some eggs and candy mm. in here. Eat it. I concur. There's absolutely nothing wrong yes. with it. Okay. It's uh, it's all perfectly fine. All right. Well, well, how about we take a snack break and go to commercial? Once again, I'm here with Terrence McKenna and the Easter Bunny, and we're talking about. Pardon me, I haven't eaten all day. <clears throat> We're talking about whether some symbolism within the Easter holiday is dubious. Something to think about. Anyway, we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. This is Dr. Franklin Rule. Yes, and not only am I here to tell you about the nutritional value of potatoes or the fact that they are rich in minerals and delicious, but there is a new way to prepare them, yes, and it is an invention of my own, and I call them rule rods. These devices are about the size of a number two pencil and contain tiny fuel rods, which, when stuck inside of a potato, will cook it thoroughly using the power of their own radioactivity, which is completely harmless because the potatoes are covered in salt, which contains iodine. Yes, rule rods cook a potato without using an oven. Guy! Dude, I'm totally sick and tired of crappy battle-based card games. Yeah, me too, bro. I wish there was something more dangerous we could play. Careful what you wish for, losers. Who the shit are you, dude? I'm Skinny White, and I've developed a new card game that will help you escape the nerd table at your local Barnes & Noble and put you directly in prison. The DA says I'll be out by tomorrow. Let's go. Allow me to introduce you to Super Flesh River Legacy, Lords of Possession. It has a long title. I like it. Shut up, Zoomer. You'll like anything. In Super Flesh Ripper Legacy, Lords of Possession, there are no complicated rules or stats. Simply draw a card to find your demon slash Hollywood influencer and do whatever they tell you. I got Asmodeus. It says if I let some guy from San Fernando Valley delete my parents, I could do a show with Travis Scott in my school cafeteria. I got Billie Eilish. It says shortly before your inevitable success, I'm supposed to drown you in a bathtub and make it look like an overdose. So, let's go! With demons such as Ball, Marduk, Moloch, Madonna, Madonna, Trippy Red, Tom Hanks, Cthulhu, Kevin Spacey, James Gunn, JoJo Siwa and more. You no longer need confused TikTokers pointing you in the wrong direction. Trade cards with your buddy until you find the spiritual disease that suits you. This one's called Flagular. It says I should let my girlfriend do an OnlyFans. But I don't have a girlfriend. I got Lilith. She says if you live stream yourself doing the drink poison challenge, you'll definitely get one. Let's go! Who needs thinly veiled Hollywood symbolism when you can call the cards exactly as you see them? Evil is everywhere! Super Flesh Ripper Legacy. Lords of Possession. Available now. All right, we're back. This is Toast to Toast. I'm your host, Skinny White, and we're talking about, uh, once again, the Easter holiday with Mr. Terrence McKenna and the Easter Bunny, who was kind enough, by the way, to have uh, delivered me an Easter basket. Oh, it's nothing. Full of enjoyable candies. Oh, ho. Oh. I'm out of breath, by the way. Sorry about no, that. No, 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 you're not. Don't tell yourself things like that, man. I'd advise against it. Otherwise, you're liable not to have any fun. Don't get trapped in the uh, the meat locker. No, I said anything about Wait. meat lockers. Well, that, that, okay. I don't know that. Okay. Good God. Was analogous. Let's, uh, let's remember what we were talking about. I want you to picture water. Uh, what were... <laughs> What were we talking the, about? The eggs, man. What, the the symbolism. Whatever. It's about the absurdity of 
changing the word but leaving the symbol it all begins to become clear which of these precedes mm -hmm. the other. What, what, what is he talking about? Are we about? still talking about Easter? What are you talking about, Terrence? If what are you talking know. about? Who sent you? Well, Alright, guys, no. everybody just be really cool right now. That's okay? right. Okay. There's no anima. How many, uh, how many of those Easter eggs did you eat, man? Um, I don't, I don't like your tone of voice when you said that. No, I you just answer the question. I only had one. Hmm. Well, uh, well, you should have broken that in half. What? Why does my desk feel prickly? Uh, the whole thing. Well, so... It doesn't matter where I touch it. The whole desk feels prickly. Are you all right? No, I'm fine. <clears throat> listen, listen to this. <laughs> oh, God, God, look, what is that? Hold Get on, here. hold on. Listen, listen. Did you hear that? Listen. Was that a bike horn? It's a clown horn. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what's what's going well, on right now? We'll try and get this thing back on track. Let's prove all these bastards wrong. Right. Okay. Uh, so, as I was saying, hmm. if you take a look at the Akkadians, or later the Canaanites, hmm. you'll find that there's not much incongruency I feel like I'm wearing the 3D glasses remember the red, and the, the red and blue 3D glasses pardon oh here um, we go I'm sorry you know how the no you can go on you know how things yes. look when you're not wearing them even though you're supposed to be kind of fuzzy please what well, I didn't Mr. Do, Bunny I didn't do anything that time who did that this is yeah, live... who did that who did here no that? wait Awful. this no, is uh, good god it's not live stream okay. from Iron Beyond. what is this what are we doing it's toast this is toast to toast uh I'm skinny white talking now, to this uh, wasn't exclusively a fertility call Terrence um McKenna at its root because in the eyes of Mesopotamia, mm. the Easter Bunny, Inanna, uh, in represented mm. love. Can anybody hear me? Be quiet. Among you other things. You can't do anything about this. No. You've already started it. So you can hear me. Easter Bunny, what was in those Easter eggs? Um, no well, nothing that you can't handle during a live broadcast. I don't think. Now, Don't tell me that. that about, but, uh, He's still going on, isn't he? You're probably going Hold on, crazy. That's, too many, too much. There's too much. There's too much going on right now. I gotta get up from this desk. Yes. I think. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Ooh. Little it up. Little it up. Who's on the board? What board? I was on the board. Oh, you lost your mind. I need some music. Where's the music? Give me the music, please. Give me the music. <sighs> Which one is that? It doesn't matter. What music is that? None of it matters. This isn't my show anymore. What is this? This isn't. This isn't toast to toast. Check out this. Check out this clown horn. This is toast to toast. Is this live? Are we live? What, is, what even is live? Take a look at this thing over here. Ooh. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, Chet. <laughs>